present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We love you this morning, Jesus. We love the word of God. We declare to you that we are under the word as much, Lord, as our wills can make it. We ask you for forgiveness where we're weak and disobedient, but we love the word. The word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, and we will, according to the psalmist, hide the word of God in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Well, help us, O Lord, and use my few moments this morning to move me and all of us to greater victory and greater joy and greater filling and greater involvement with the living God because of all that Jesus did. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have 15 days left out of 40. And I've asked you to do three things. Let me repeat them again. I've asked you to do, I use the word contemplation. Uh, that's kind of a, can be a spooky word for some, but I don't mean it in a spooky, weirdo way. I just mean, I, I want you to be thinking about yourselves. And, and do, not that I want you to be narcissistic, not that I want you to be selfish, but I, I just think that we have to think about ourselves in proper ways. How is my life aligning and not aligning with God? I think we need to think about that more. So with the next two weeks, as you're on the road, in the car, at the kitchen sink, in doing household chores, in the lawn, with the neighbors, would you be thinking about your own souls? And where are you? Where am I with God? And as you do that, I'm asking you to be praying at the same time. Praying those things. Oh Lord, why? Why am I doing that? Why do I not do this? Why am I the way I am? And why don't I seem to get off the plateau of where things have been for decades in my life? And as you pray, consider coming to join us in prayer congregationally. We do that once a week. And then add the, add the thing that Westerners don't like. Add the fasting thing. So I'm asking for three separate days of your choice to take a 16 to 18 hour fast. And just say, Lord, whatever this does, hear my prayer, the prayer of my body uh, to you. So I'm asking you to uh, do precisely that. And I'm this morning, as we're continuing to think about Romans 6, I've got this thought in my head. You know, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist shouted that at the River Jordan. So my question is, why? If Jesus has come to take away my sin, why do I struggle with sin like gum on my shoe? There's a tension here. You must all feel it. He's come to take away my sin the sin of the world, and yet I've put my faith in Jesus, and some sins evaporated at first instance, and some little bit with a little bit of prayer effort, and some with a little bit of counseling, and then there's just some aspects of me that don't seem to move. How is that? And I want to talk to that, to that reality. And so I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles, everybody turn in their Bibles, to Genesis chapter 4. Because if I were to ask a Sunday school class of kids, maybe adults too, what is sin? And I get the response, sin is transgression against God. Or sin is transgression against the law of God. And if you answered that in that way, you would be correct. That is correct. But I would say in its correctness, it's rather deficient. 
So you got that much correct. But it's not the whole thing. And so I, I want us to go to Genesis chapter 4. Because in Genesis chapter 3, you get the first sin. And you understand from Genesis 3 when Eve and Adam took the fruit of the tree that God had said, don't do that. And they did. And so in that sense, sin now, we see what sin is. It's transgression against God, against the law of God. But when we go to Genesis 4, I think you get an an added complexion about the reality of sin. And so I, I'm turning there to Genesis chapter 4. I want you, you to read with me along silently as I go through the scripture carefully. 4, 1 through 16. Now, I'm talking about Adam, now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived, and I have had this thought as I'm reading this passage, I wonder why, I, I wonder why the writer of Genesis put the pen to the parchment and said, and they had relations. It's kind of like they should have just said, they conceived and, and had a child. Well, why does it say they had sex? Or, they, or if you're reading in your English Standard Version or the King James, they the man knew his wife and so it says it softly but the point is that they they had sex together and they conceived and it's like for a historical document it's like is, is that necessary to say that and there it actually is a little bit necessary because of what the rest of the verse says the man had relations with his wife eve and she conceived and gave birth to cain and she said i have obtained a male child with the help of the Lord. I find that to be really important for us today. That Eve at the beginning goes, well, I, I, we had sex, but the child came with the help of the Lord. I think we need to go back to this for our culture. Because the culture today is, I don't know how babies are made, let, 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 let's do it, and, and, and we did it. And uh, we, we are giving God less and less and less and less credit. And I think this is important. It's at the very beginning of the Bible that the, the first woman conceived and said, God, God was in this. And I just think that's, that's a beautiful thing that we need to retain. And, and so Cain is born. It's a, his name is, is, is a kind of mutation of the word gotten. And so I'm so proud that God helped me get him that his name is got him. I have obtained a male child with the help of the Lord. And again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of flocks, a shepherd. But Cain was a cultivator of the ground, a farmer or an agriculturalist or a cultivator, as my, my New American Standard version says. And it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought an offering from the firstborn of his flock and from their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. When I see this passage, my mind always goes back to the first time I heard this story in my first grade class. A nun was teaching it. Sister Timothy, she was like 18 years old. She was like, she was like wow, she's, she's just a beautiful angel. And she drew on the chalkboard Cain's offering. And she said, she, 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 Cain brought, and she, she put in fruit, little grapes and apples, but she, she colored it in such a way. And then she turned to the class and she said, because he brought rotten fruit. And Abel brought and brought a little sheep and the best of his flock. And so I, my first understanding was that Cain uh, gave God second, second fiddle or rotten stuff. And Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. And God had regard for what Abel did, but not for Cain. But we don't have, we don't have the authority 
to come to that conclusion. That Cain brought bad fruit and Cain brought, and Abel brought good sheep. But it could be. It could also be, excuse my ear for coming off, it could be that uh, God had given uh, Abel and Cain uh, instructions on how to make an offering like he will do under the law. You bring an offering, you bring a sheep or a goat or a bull. You don't bring fruit. And maybe God had did that and Cain said, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want to do. But I have no authority to go there either because it doesn't say. It could also be that Cain brought a, his best God had given no instructions. Abel brought his best. But Cain's heart was not right. So if you look at the scripture carefully, it says, God had no regard for Cain and his offering. And God had regard for Abel. And, his, and I have no authority to say the third option either, only that this is what happened. The offerings were made, and Cain's is not accepted. And Abel's, God has regard for Abel. I'm in verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And so Cain became very angry, and his face was gloomy. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face gloomy? If you do well, will your face not be cheerful? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you. But you must master it. And Cain talked to his brother, or uh, one version says Cain told his brother, Abel. And it happened that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. So now you have just disobedience in chapter 3. Just disobedience. But now you have not an instruction from the Lord. You have a man from his own will going to pound up against his brother and let, let him be dead in the field. I mean, he murders somebody. I mean, this is exponentially worse than Adam and Eve. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper or something? And then he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. This is highly poetic. So I don't, I don't think that there's a little mouths on, on red blood cells crying. But this is how the ancients wrote. And so you could say it's hyperbolic and it really didn't happen this way, but I, I think the way the scripture writer is writing is he's trying to say that there is, there is something, there is something that it's best expressed by saying your brother's blood is crying out to my ears from the ground. And so it's, it's drawing attention to the fact that God's in all his censoriousness and all his ability to sense what's happening on the planet. The, it's like the blood is crying out to me. I know what's going on, says God. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a wanderer and a drifter on the earth. So this consequence now is not to mankind because we have had fabulous agricultural produce around the planet and in our country. So it's not like mankind has been cursed. It's like the man has been cursed as a cultivator of the ground and now he's working it and working it and God said and it won't yield for you when you cultivate the ground it will no longer yield its strength to you you will be a wanderer and a drifter on the earth and Cain said to the Lord my, my punishment is too great to endure behold you have driven me this day from the face of the ground and I will be hidden from your face and I will be a wanderer and a drifter on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me and so Cain has this sense of guiltiness 
But if I can say this, it seems to me that it is going beyond what is real. And so it, it doesn't this happen to me. You do something wrong, and if you have a sharp conscience, it's like, God's really going to, he's really going to kill me now like this. And, and Cain just goes a little bit berserk. So they're going to kill me. And God, and God says, no, where am I? Thank you. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him seven times as much. And the Lord placed, and I see the compassion of God saying, no, 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 Cain, no, we're not going that far. Okay, I'll put a mark on you. And so you will know that whoever sees you, they'll leave you alone. And therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him seven times as much. And the Lord placed a mark on on Cain so that no one finding him would kill him. Now I just, I, I know I flew over this, but I want you to just go back real quickly to the questions. There are five questions that God asks. Verse six, <clears throat> he says, why are you angry? Question one, why is your face gloomy? Question two, and then a kind of rhetorical question, if you do well, will not your face be cheerful? Verse 3, and then verse 9, where is Abel your brother? What have you done? Now God's asking all kinds of questions that he knows the answers already. So what's he doing? He's going to Cain. And he's saying, I'm going to talk in such a way as to put thoughts in your head that I want you to think. What have you done? Why are you so downcast? Why are you moody? Why are you gloomy? Why are you so angry? I want you to think about this. That's why I'm asking us in these 40 days to think about yourself so that you can do what God wants us to do. He wants us to steward and cultivate, not the ground, the soil of your heart. This is how you do it. You think and you say, why am I the way I am? Why, why am I so when that person talks to me, why, why do I get so irritated? Or, or when the boss tells me to do something, why do I get so angry? Why am I the way I am? And for you to not only do this because it's Lent, but to start living in this way will help you. This is why I'm, I'm asking you to do three things. But zero in now on this verse 7, which is really why I'm bringing you to this passage. He asks, if you do well, will not your face be cheerful? And then he makes a comment. It's not a question now. And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you. And so here you have a, 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 a description of sin that you don't get in Genesis chapter 3, which is sin's transgression against God. But you come in chapter 4 and God is telling Cain through some poetical, metaphorical, hyperbolic language that sin is like an enemy predator. The one version, my version says crouching, the version I have at home, crouching at the door. Why does a lion crouch and lurk? Two reasons. One, he doesn't want his, his victim to see him in the prairie grass. And two, he wants to be in a posture. So when it's just right, pow, I spring from my crouching position. God is describing sin now as kind of a, kind of like an animal, kind of like a predator. Sarah and I took a, we never, we really never take this long a vacation. We took five days. We just did, um, I'm not going to impress you by saying we took a cheapo vacation. But we love to do museums and, and just learn things. And so we went to Galena and one of, we toured the home of Ulysses S. Grant and then we crossed the river to Dubuque and we went to the Mississippi River Museum and Maritime. 
uh, maritime aquarium. And uh, we've sat and watched a movie about cephalopods in the Mississippi River. And the cephalopod is like the octopus family and stuff, and they, all these weird old creatures in the water. And this one cephalopod that, that um, will swim slowly and find something to eat. And then it slowly, it's like, like the movie Alien, it opens its mouth and, and the thing comes out like this. And it, like this, and it brings in its, its victim. And the narrator says, and this cephalopod actually, actually poisons its victim so that it, it's like, okay, okay, just, you know, it doesn't, he doesn't fight. And then it, and it eats it, and I go, oh, that, this is like sin. It's like, how often do we kind of mindlessly just kind of go, okay. And, we, and, we, and it eats us. The, the sin eats us. It's, and so the, my point is that sin is not as simple as you want to think it is. It's more complex, like a cephalopod is much more complex than an amoeba. And you need to think that it's of your awareness that it's, there's something about it that's trying to get me. And its desire is for me. So it's an enemy predator functionality in the doings of sin. So to go back to what Chris was trying to say is um, that it might be, might be not the, the, the most accurate thing in the world to say that we have a sin nature in the sense that you're, if you think of yourself as kind of, I've got a white dog and a black dog inside me, kind of a white ghost and a, and a black ghost, a white soul and a black soul. And, and he was trying to say, it's, you don't, you're not composed like that when we say we have a sin nature. It may be more right to say you have sin which has a nature. And the sin has a nature like an enemy predator. We don't think of that when we get up on any given Monday morning, do we? And the next thing I see is the compassion of the Lord who says to Cain, you know, I, I'll put a, a mark on you. you, you you're going too far. You're going too far. I really, I really, really love you. I'm really I'm going to take care of you. And so I see in verse 7, uh, what I think, maybe I'm, this is the way I'm reading it to me, to myself, and if you do not do well, sin's lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you, you gotta, you gotta master it. What does this sound like? Romans 6, 12 through 14. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. You're not under law. You must master it, says Paul. And he goes back to language that's so much like Genesis 4. So I got two thoughts here in, the, in this passage. One is sin is not as simple as you think. It's more complex. And the complexity is like it's, like it's an animate thing. It's like AI. It like thinks. Kind of. And that's all that you have. But it's complex and it's dangerous, and two, God is your cheerleader. The spirit of the Lord inside you is your cheerleader, saying, I want you, I want you to master it. And so when I put those two things together, that sin is actually an, an, like something, like an animate enemy, and God is my cheerleader saying, I don't want this to get you, I want you to get it. As it says in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace soon will crush Satan under your feet, like this, under your feet. Not, I'll do it for you. So he's, he's saying, I want you involved. I want you in it. I want you to, to step in and crush it. So you need to be relentless as a Christian. You need to be ruthless as a Christian, and I'm under a burden in my heart because I think my own country, my own country, I took the oath of, uh, of, the, of the protecting the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I remember saying that in Tecumseh Court in the Naval Academy and going, domestic? What the heck is that? We have domestic enemies now. It's us. 
God wants us to master the thing that's getting us. And in order to do that, you need to live as a Christian relentlessly in pursuit of God. Ruthlessly in pursuit of God. And my, my burden is we, we are just lazy. We're lazy. We just love the comforts that the American Western lifestyle has given us. And we think, I go to church. I read my Bible. That's it. That's it. It's not it. It's what you do after church 24-7 conquering your sin. I had a guy call me this week. Someone won't be real happy about hearing this on the air, but it was before I came to, right before I came to Summit Harvest. I've been having this friendship with this guy for, for two years. And, um, and so he was, being, he was in counseling in his church, in the church that I was in. And I, I was getting more and more irritated at, at the discovery of the biblical counseling that was happening with him where they would say you you're you're doing this all the time and what does the bible say and stop doing it still stop doing it still stop doing it and i was getting irritated at, at, the, at the biblical counseling dynamic because he couldn't stop it that's why he was counseling it's kind of, it, it doesn't fix by going fix it fix it fix it fix it i said fix it fix it and, and, and so um his his thing was not getting and because of his background his unique background the sins of his the unique sins of his testimony and because of the nature of what was going on in his mind I quietly guessed, like I've guessed in my journey here at Summit Harvest, I've guessed that his problem was not so much uh, just a transgression that he needed to stop. I, I, I thought it was devilish powers at work in him. And so after two years, right before I stepped into the Summit Harvest, I meet in his house and I say to him, John, I'm going to pray for you. And then in the, the voice that I'm praying for you, I'm going to talk to that. What's that? I don't really know what that is. Because it could be a psychological thing, the medication you're taking. But it could be the devil behind it. I can't see it, but it smells to me like the devil. And so I just want to tell it to leave and leave you alone. So we do do that, and he um, he has release. He goes on. He leaves the church, and he they he leaves geographies and was it has been in Atlanta, Georgia, for two years now. A, a, a different, free. He calls me this week, and he says, Michael, I, it's back again. I, I, I could feel the anxiety in his voice. He said, Michael, why? 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 If, if, if salvation's a grace, if what God gives is a gift, why do I have to fight for it? And I told John, so I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this. Isn't it weird, John? Isn't it, isn't it strange that God says to Israel in the big books of the Bible, the, the, the narrative, the Old Testament, he gives the land to Israel and says, I give it to you. It's your possession. It's yours. God is doing this for you. And he makes a miracle of the Jordan River parting and they step in with the Ark of the Testimony. God is with us and they cross over to Jericho and Ai. And from the beginning of the land, John, I'm talking to him on the phone, from the beginning, beginning they have to fight for every single town that is their possession it's like they, they got to be walking around going i thought god gave it to me i thought it, it was a possession from god i thought it was grace i thought it was a gift of god why the heck do i have to fight i said john i don't know the answer to that except that it is written in Scripture, that that's a reality, and now my interpretation, that I think things in the Old Testament were written for our instruction. Our instruction. Christian instruction. 
So that we, God gives us, God gives us a possession of heaven. But brother and sister, you have to fight for it. And that, it seems like a paradox. I know it seems like a paradox. It is kind of a paradox. But for me to say, it's all just great, don't bother, don't fight, would be leading you down a wrong path. And you need to be relentless and ruthless in your private walk with Jesus, where sins are crouching at the door. If you don't, you will live a paralyzed life. You will be inert as a, as a Christian. And I just, I just... Risky language. I don't want to offend anybody in the room. Because behind, behind the scenes, we elders are having a, you know, not a, an intense discussion, a relaxed discussion. Once in a while, we're, we're just asking the question, do, uh, is, we, we need to put to our souls, are we, are we talking in a way, doing things in a way, behaving in a way that would lead some sensitive souls to say, some at harvest is misogynistic. That the women, they're, they're like second class. and they can, they can sit in the corner. And the men, we're King Kong. We're in charge. And, and, and I'm, I'm really sensitive to this because we are complementarian by declaration, but there are some knobhead, bonehead complementarians who say, I'm complementarian. And, and then they go around like, like this. And I go, oh, that's, that's wrong and that's sin so no, no mark my words because i'm talking to the man the men in in the church knowing that the ladies are hearing um it has occurred to me so you could you could you could stone me since i've been reading the bible it seems to me that this book is uniquely uh sensitive to the man it, it, it like talks in male language. You go, what are you talking about? I'm saying the, the whole narrative from soup to nuts is about warfare and adjudic adjudication in the courts. Those are man's world things that a man can identify. We've made church, uh, you know, I'm sure there are a bazillion reasons why, but we've made it so domesticated that I think sometimes the church doesn't talk to the man. And I'm telling you, you need to be like, you, you, what, are the, what are the King James Version? I can't remember the reference. Quit ye like men. M meaning, stand up and be a man and live for God. <laughs> what to say? Talking to the man. And I, I'm talking to our men. You need to live for God relentlessly, unrelenting, vigorously, tightly. Military, I mean, when, when my, first, my first night in, at, uh, at the Naval Academy, you know, where we had this day of uh, being yelled at, la, 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 and then the next day, we got to get up at 5.30 in the morning, why, why, why? And we're, we're in the parking lot having to warm up to, to run a couple of miles to the, to the field where we do calisthenics and puke our guts out by breakfast. Why did we have to do that? Because the military knows that if you're soft in a time of peace, you will not win in a time of war. And so they're, they're, they're trying to inculcate in us a love and a devotion for physical discipline. That's not really your military identity. It prepares you for your military identity. But you can never let it go because you always need to be in shape. And you always need to be in shape in order to win the war. And so for the Christian, what that means is your men, your devotional life, you need to have a quiet time. You have to have a quiet time. But the quiet time doesn't define you and describe you as a Christian. Like, look, I'm a good Christian. I have a quiet time. It's just your discipline so that you could be available and movable by the Spirit of God in your life. So, so it's, it's your identity is what is you in life with God. And the disciplines that you do, the regimen that you do, the prayer that you do, the quiet time that you do, you need to be unrelenting. I'm asking you rhetorically, am I unrelenting with my devotional life? That's just the discipline. And I would suggest that we ask this of God. 
when we say, what, what am I doing? Who am I? Where am I? That we learn to live like soldiers. See, that's a man's language. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying now to the ladies who I know are listening also, I'm not saying this applies to your husband and doesn't apply to you. It really applies to you. Because if you read about the Proverbs 31 woman, the excellent wife, you go, that woman is a businesswoman. She gets up in the middle of the night and works for the care of her children. Then she goes out and buys stuff, buys a piece of land. I mean, she, she's like, she is, she is unrelenting. And so the, the very characteristics of relentlessness and ruthlessness and vigor and toughness apply to the woman. While in my opinion, the whole book really is speaking, speaking, inviting the man to enter in. So, that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm over time, I'm sure. I got carried away. <clears throat> so, I leave you to yourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for grace. Thank you for forgiveness. I ask you, Lord, to help us not walk according to the toned down rhythm of the culture, but to march to the drummer of the Spirit of the Lord. Raise up a little army in our family of God, Summit Harvest Church. Help us to live, Lord, with vigor and intensity, temerity and drive and purpose. Help us to wake up in the morning and put down the things that torment our lives and keep our noses in the mud. Oh Lord Jesus, we need you every moment. Thank you for the family of God and the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.